Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, actually, I'd just like to say I'm really, really chuffed to be doing this. Um, I first uh, got into Clock DVA in 1981, um, and I just realised I've left my questions in my jacket. Give me one second. Can you hear us, Taz? Yes, oh, yes, okay. I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to uh, well, welcome from Amsterdam there. So, <laughs> so, so, hi, everyone. So we're yeah. just, just waiting now. There we go. Now, Taz. Hello. Hello. Hi. Right, yeah, so as I was saying, um, I got into Clock DVA in 1981 when I was a student and I was into all things Sheffield. Um, and, you know, I think then and now, I'm just very impressed with the work that Addy's done for various reasons. Um, the, first of all, we both, it turns out when we chatted recently, we both read a book called um, Dada Art and Anti-Art in our formative years by Hans Richter, and it had a profound effect. I think got something on my way of thinking, and I think Addy's way of music making um, I appreciate um, his long-standing involvement with um, electronics and the longevity. I mean, he obviously stretching activity stretching back 50 years, and of course it'll stretch on. Um, also, the European com its component, I was like that, as opposed to the American one, I, it's something that was greatly appreciated. So, for various reasons and various others as well, you know, I'm very much of a fan and. Uh, Thanks a lot for coming down, and um, yeah, so, guys, um, I thought I'd begin somewhere in the middle, um, and basically just talk to how you got together, basically, how that happened. With Ted? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, it was through um, the connection uh, about ambisonics, actually, and yeah. through the antidote, uh, and Ted was... Um, doing some research into uh, ambisonics and uh, he was a big fan I think it was the TAG album, the Digitaria album which was all uh, a full ambisonic recording uh, we made and released uh, it was through that album that he that his interest in, in, in surround sound or ambisonic sound sound field uh, he became interested, so he, it was sort of like a natural thing to, to contact me as such, you know, to see if uh, he was interested in, 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 you know, pursuing more ambisonic works, you know, which I was. And uh, so it was really through that connection uh, of that album and the work I've been making with the Anti Group that I made first contact with Tez. Yeah, because I mean, Ted, I mean, you, you, you're saying that really it was perhaps the anti group, more even than Clock DVA, that first sort of sparked your interest in working with Addy. Well, yeah, I've been uh, obviously a, a great fan of both projects. Clock DVA, I think my, my first album of DVA was Advantage in 84, I think. And then I started following the anti group even more closely because. That, that was even more interesting for me, was a little bit more experimental. But then, yeah, the ambisonic thing was really kind of a game changer for me. And actually, after that, I must say also the ontological series, because I was in Prato, it was this famous performance by Clock TV in Italy. Uh, that was, I think, 87. And that was a, quite, a, quite a quite a shocker for me in terms of like something completely new, completely different, very experimental, very hypnotic, very immersive. And um, so I, I started you know, my my own research into this kind of immersive sound and ambisonics. And much later, it was 2010, it, that I contacted Andy asking him if he was interested in 
maybe re, um, remaking the, the digitaria of the method installation so that people could experience the ambisonic sound feed that was originally recorded for this album as a, you know, as a, as a real immersive uh, thing. So and that, that's where we started this thing. Mm. Then it went off, um, of course, being part of not just uh, that project, which actually we never really materialized that very project of the installation, because Adi got really busy also reactivating the anti group and, and later on, just a year later, I think, the clock VA and he asked me to join the project. So of course, I think, yeah, that was it. All right, yeah. And I think it's sometimes hard, you know, when people work together in the sort of realms of electronics to sort of work out <laughs> the division of labor and how you work together. It seems to be quite a complicated thing. But I always get the, I get the impression that with you guys, I mean, although we have to be remote tonight, that it's very important to have that kind of strong and working electronics. It's very important to have that very strong human connection and ideally to be in the same room when you're working and having that sort of, I don't know, maybe telepathy is a strong Yeah, idea, yeah, no, no, I agree totally. Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, as often as we can, we will work together uh, in the studio. I mean, before the pandemic, I was going over to Amsterdam quite often and we were working in the studio in Amsterdam, hands-on kind of thing, you know, and uh, working closely together. Uh, which is always preferable, I think. Uh, so much can be done, I think, remotely, you know, with, with, with sound files or, or compositions. But ideally, you know, for me, uh, working with uh, the person is, you know, the best way uh, I always find. Uh, and it's more immediate, more instant, more intuitive, more uh, feel. Uh, music is a feel, I think. It, 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 you feel music. It, it's, it is. It's, it, it can be intellectualized. And we can talk about it, but in the end, uh, you know, the feel is almost immediate. I think you know, you you can tell straight away. You hear something, whether it engages you or it doesn't engage you. You know, that is straight away, and you get that feeling. And so I think this is important in music when musicians collaborate. I mean, in, in say like jazz or something like that, you know, improvisation mm. is, 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 a, is a kind of a psychic automatism. Yeah. Uh, a kind of joining and, and really going further with the, the material in an instant kind of way and knowing how music changes and, and being able to, you, you kind of jump ahead almost, you kind of, and good musicians getting together, improvising, they, they can almost read their mind, each of his minds and, you know, they'll make a move and, and you know, they'll follow or someone will mm. trigger something and, you know, and it's all, it's kind of, it's a magical thing, I think, as well, you know. This is sort of implicit conversation and implicit understanding. Yeah, almost, yeah. Maybe. Finishing yeah. each other's sentences. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Thing, yeah. That, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's, a, there's an absolute uh, synchronicity. I mean, I, I think of it like that, psychic automatism, because I, I remember a, a surrealist uh, um, artist, a British artist, uh, I forget his name now, um, he, it was on a radio <laughs> program, but he was talking about surrealism, and then he was talking about Breton, was saying about psychic automatism so on in art and in surrealism and he said to him jazz had always been like that as well that, that it was a psychic automatism it was a pure kind of example of it you know and it always kind of stuck in my mind you know this 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 relationship he, he, he talked about and um, what breton had said you know uh, in the manifesto so yeah. going back i do believe into a relationship between the human being in art is fundamental. Um, technology is really interesting. Uh, and I know, you know, we've, we've got things now like this bot where, where it calculates and it can make, you know, it can make music in oh, a yes, or yeah. it can write uh, an article. Or, or, Fortunately, rubbish so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but this idea of 
you know, that, that machines can somehow take over. I don't think that's, that, that's, that's going to ever happen really because I think in some senses, yeah, they can do things. It's a tool, but it, it will never replace uh, an artist. I think uh, Malovich said something I read sort of recently. He said that even with the most simplest of uh, tools, uh, it could never be re a, a machine, of, even the highest technology, could never do what a human being can do with very simple things, you know, like paint and a brush, you know, can make art, which is transcendental, which is transcendent. A machine can't do that. So, I think. And also, they have the sort of understanding that Malevich did, you know, and we talked at one time about the black square in Malevich, and it's a sort of place from which everything proceeds. And I always feel like, whenever I listen to Clock, I always feel like it's proceeding from this black square, <laughs> the kind of attendant meaning of that. And so, looking at the new album, um, Oasis, obviously not to be confused with the um, Oasis tribute band, uh, but uh, in fact, it's the word Oasis actually. You, you no, can't, yeah, no, Oasis. Yeah, it's no, Oasis. Yeah, it's it's to do with uh, consciousness. I think. Yeah, it's a, a study of uh, how how we you know perceive or how how consciousness is uh, what it is exactly. And we we still don't really know. I mean, you know, uh, it's interesting that. I was thinking about it the other day, you know, like we're all born with the same biological brain, but actually the way we use that brain is so different in different people, you know, like, you know, why, why aren't we all Einstein? You know, why aren't we all, you know, Van Gogh or whatever, you know, or Rembrandt or whoever, you know. And it's the way the consciousness works, how that creativity in consciousness is, is, uh, is, is, is Created in a way of well, why we don't really we don't really know how it is, you know. Um, it's an interesting question, I think, because it, it, it's it's something outside of science in many ways. I mean, there, I mean, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of experiments in, in consciousness, uh, but not enough, I don't think. I think that aspect is very under explored and it needs to be more explored i think in in general we're spending a lot of money on externalization of things you know mm. of ways of uh, achieving things but actually you know the human mind is 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 limitless and and they say you know we're only using a partial of it so why aren't we you know working on the mind, why aren't we developing consciousness that, that goes further and further to, to understand more and more and maybe through that we get to understand how we all should be living, you know, uh, without all these, you know, problems. I remember, I remember reading, I think it was like 15, 20 years ago, talking about, um, I don't know, Silicon Valley, Valley and all the kind of sort of leading edge activities that are going on there in the field of tech or whatever and saying, Whatever they're creating, whatever they're doing, yeah, there's nothing there that matches the sophistication of the brain of the security guard. But, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah, yeah, it's true. But the, the, thematically, I mean, the album is kind of. I mean, you, you've heard it earlier on, and you've got the sense of this kind of this suspension of like sort of lush, minimal, dark electronica and so forth. But the titles, I think, you know, like the simulation of the self and the fall of the dream machine, uh, the engines of in intimidation. And I think there is a, you know, there's a definitely a sort of sense of a profound mistrust of the way that, like, contemporary technologies are taking us. And I think you, know, you talked about a sense of enslavement, really. I mean, back in the late 1970s, I remember all the talk was about, you know, silicon chip, microchip, and how these things were going to liberate us. You know, vast amounts of leisure time were going to be created through automation, but that hasn't panned out. And... And again, you, know, you do typically get the sense that we are kind of, in some senses, slaves to all of this. Absolutely, yeah, I think it's true. You know, we, 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 the, the technology is, uh, becomes like a ubiquitous uh, element uh, that we, you know, we, we, we start to use that and become uh, dependent on that. And then when, if that's removed, we're really stuck, you know, we really get 
uh, you know, into a, in a bad situation because we can't do it in another way, you know. Um, whereas, you know, previously there were alternatives to things, you know. Uh, you know, you could write a letter, you could, you know, you could do something else, you know, there was ways and means of doing things, but we're so reliant now on technology. You know, I was talking to a couple of friends earlier about, you know, sort of technology rage, you know. We can all kind of, you know, get that sense of when when technology goes haywire or it falls down in some ways and it's so frustrating, you know. You feel, you feel like smashing the thing, you know, but we know that's yeah. not going to be any use, you know. I remember, I mean, you know, the moment of absolute terror, you know, it was realising I'd lost my mobile phone. I was like losing a pacemaker or something yeah. like that. You know, it made me really yeah. realise how attached I am sure. to the grid Absolutely. and have been attached to it for about you know about yeah, yeah. fifteen totally. years. You know, totally. It's and it is a little bit alarming sometimes. You know, see like that and scrolling mile after mile after mile and sort of being part of the great data harvest as well. That's being kind of you know used for whatever purposes. To say nothing of the whole ecological aspect of it as well. Yes, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, not yeah. It, it, it's really it, it, it's it, the album's really about these elements, really like like technology's um, intrusion, I guess, into our way of being, you know, uh, and how it's used. Uh, I'm not saying technology is a bad thing, but it, there's a tendency to lose uh, something in the process of something else. You know, it's like you know, uh, CGI, let's say, took away all these great craftsmen who used to make film sets and built things and did painted scenes and all kinds of things, you know. It took away um, a lot of that, you know. Uh, similar like AI, I guess, you know, where a machine's created, so, but it hasn't got that feel, it hasn't got that kind of authenticity of humanness that was was there in other in other things before it, you know, like the craft of things. You know. I think it's important, you know, getting back to to, to craft and making making things again, you know, making the physical thing. You know, uh, I mean, I can see the advantage of uh, you know downloads and, and being able to stream things and so on. But I don't think there's any substitute for a, you know the real McCoy, you know, the book or the album, you know, or getting an album with a, a nice sleeve, you know, with a, you know, with a nice album designs and so on. I mean, it's, you know, it, it feels better yeah. than something that's kind of ethereal and, you know, could go any minute, kind of thing. <laughs> like your phone, you know, if you put yeah. all your fingers on a phone, you know, and you, yes. you, you, you lost all your, your music, you know, whereas... You know, if you've got the proper copy of it, you know. I always buy things, you know, if I like them, I buy them. I shall, I shall go and buy it, you know. Yeah. And, and have it as a, as a in, in, in a collection, you know, and be able to draw it out and play it or whatever. Same as books, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for books. I can't really read so much on computer screens. I don't think it gets really too much for me. It's good for research and things like that. Actual yeah. Actual reading, I don't know. So, sort of having started in the middle, to go right back to the beginning, um, and a lot of it seems to have started with this the Meat Whistle project in Sheffield, and that's getting special around about like probably about seventy three or seventy four, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just yourself. I mean, this was the sort of perhaps the sort of the cradle of what later becomes known as the Sheffield scene, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, about. yeah. I mean, again, that was that was really a, a kind of. Uh, uh, a resource really for us uh, t to use in a way. It was like uh, it was funded by the council, but they didn't really have any sort of directive in in the sense that it, you know it, we had to have an outcome from it. You know, it, it it wasn't based on like finding jobs or something like this. It was just really a place to experiment, which is you know fundamentally. A brilliant thing to, to have, you know, in society, and there should be more of it. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have them like that anymore. You know, the funding is funding for art in any way has been gradually eroded and eroded away. You know, 
but yeah, I mean, we met and sort of experimented with theatre and, and music. Uh, that's where we really started to do the, the sort of first kind of tentative musical uh, exploration, you know. Mm. But it was a, a kind of ideal uh, setup, really, you know. And we had, you know, like good people who were running it who didn't really enforce any kind of. We were almost self governed in a way. It was a bit like uh, Summerhill. Mm. A.S. Neil, educationalist who uh, believed in free schools and, and, and that children and, and so on, they should govern themselves and, and make their own timetables, etc., etc. And often this works better than one that's enforced. Mm. And people kind of explore their own interests, which I think, again, is... Prim primarily what we should be doing anyway. Yeah. Because if we, if we pursue our interests, we we're, all we need is is facility or someone to facilitate that interest, you know, give us the the, the power to, to do that, you know. Uh, and schools don't really work like that. Do you know what I mean? And, and who did you meet there? I mean, that was part of Well, uh, Ian Craig Marsh, who... Uh, we, we were in the future, and Martin Ware, again, the, the three of us uh, started the, the, the sort of kind of electronic trio. Uh, I think Glenn, Glenn Gray, who was there, he sort of later uh, got involved with uh, Evan 17 and so on. Uh, Phil Oakley was around, mm. but not as much uh, at that time. He, he, he did come sometimes. Uh, he was working, I think he was working as a, a porter for uh, um, a hospital, you know. He was more like a friend of uh, Martin's and stuff. So. But I'm trying to think of who else was there. Uh, what about the calves? Did they, did they intersect with it at all? Cabri Voltaire, did they? Cabri Voltaire, yeah, Cabri Voltaire, we, we, I knew Cabri Voltaire through a, a friend. and They were already active, probably. At this yeah, point. they were they were doing stuff already. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely, they were doing stuff already. And we sort of um, kind of hooked up with them, became friends, and sort of hung out. So it was like a social thing, really, you know, uh, rather than it being uh, centralised in, in meet whistle. It was like after meet whistle, you know, we'd go out and we'd do clubs or whatever. We'd go up to a pub or a wine bar and we'd meet up and just generally hang out and. And fun, you know, just. But it's funny when people talk about like the Sheffield scene or whatever. It's a bit like people talk about the goth scene, as if there's like hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of people across the city, you know. And it quite often turns out to be just a group of five or six people, yeah, all be people who all turn out to be phenomenally influential and you know successful, whatever, yeah. in their own way. And it sounds a little bit like that. And then Sheffield becomes defined almost, you know, as having a. The sea, where it sounds like in a way you probably came from a sort of a void, really. Yeah, it was in a way. Yeah, I think uh, I, I did say at one time, you know, uh, Sheffield was a sort of cultural kind of wasteland in many ways, you know. It didn't oh, have Tony Christie. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't have um, like galleries and so on, you know, it didn't have like art spaces and stuff that was going on, and there was no real scene as such. So in that time, it was quite difficult, really, to to uh, to do stuff in a while because you know there was no venues, so you know it was through uh, people uh, doing something off their own sort of initiative, you know. It, also, just creating from scratch. Yeah, you know, exactly. tabula rasa, I mean, say, and it, it's, yeah, it's yeah. you know you've got the opportunity to begin again and, and again with that sort of very basic electronic equipment that you were able to get hold of back in the mid 70s just sort of inscribe something on a blank sheet and um, absolutely yeah. yeah 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 i mean even i mean synthesizers were very expensive uh, to, to to buy at that point anyway you know and it was only really through the introduction of uh, technologies like coal and, and so on that first began making the, uh, the, the, the entry level synthesizers, you know, that we were able to actually engage with stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't use any electronics at all. I was just using tape, tape recorders in the future. I just used tape loops. 
uh, processing uh, things, you know, because I I wasn't really kind of music at that point for me was was a, a, a kind of something that I'd not really thought about. It was because yeah. I was more interested in art and so on and theatre and so on. And so when we started doing some music, I uh, I mean I. I like music, don't get me wrong, I, I, I listened to music and I, I liked music, but in terms of making it something as an art form mm. that I could pursue, I didn't really think about it, so I came kind of by an accident. Really. The great thing was, I guess, at that point, is that although you were sort of, I mean, you were making it the, the, the music that you made, it was collected on the horologies. Yeah, but yeah. You weren't like thinking like Manfred Mann's Earth Band or whatever, being a wizard <laughs> on the lips on it or anything like that. You were thinking, and that's perhaps when the art background comes from useful, you think conceptually, just thinking of like assembling sound, you know, creating all the abstracts or whatever, and that kind of thing. Sure, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, um, I mean, I took my kind of uh, inspiration from people like uh, Il Al, Memoraglu, and, and John Cage, and Birio, and, and so on, and, and uh, David Tudor, and all these sort of avant-garde uh, people. I had some recordings of them as well and stuff, and I'd been kind of making kind of concrete recordings, you know, going out with tape recorders and recording these because the first Walkmans was made, being made available, you know, so I was discovering why is it making sound, textual sound, you know, with just those elements, you know, recorded sound field elements. So. And then, obviously, with the with the future, we we developed it further and so on. And then it became more. Uh, 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 it became more. Uh, the whole scene, in fact, became more kind of focused on actually uh, making music, and you know, making music that would. Appeal to more people, you know. I mean, the, you know, the future, especially the future. I mean, when when we sort of went our own ways, it was like I think you know Martin probably more than Ian was more focused towards a more kind of pop music, you know, wanting to create a kind of uh, an electronic pop music, which is you know not 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 uh, a bad thing, but uh, it didn't sort of appeal to me to do commercial type music so I just carried on really doing what I was doing really experimenting. It's extraordinary to think of that like all that activity going on in a few short years later yeah. it becomes a sort of cornerstone to yeah, sure. half, you know, a few short years to you know I was working in a porter in a hospital to I was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but you know that, that, that thing that is really quite exciting. yeah it's true I mean you know when I think of things now like you know I think of uh, Human League now like say Dare or something like that and you've got like tracks from Dare that are on advertisements for beer you know and people are like chanting it like it's a football chant you know you know you would have never yeah. kind of envisaged that at that time that, that would end up, you know, event, you know, yeah. being so accessible, so total, yeah. uh, crossing, you know, into the mass consciousness, you know. Mm. So it was, a, it, it's kind of strange for me to kind of hear that, you know, what I mean, and it being made into some kind of, you know, anthem like that because I don't know. They obviously they wanted to make music that appealed to to. To a wider audience, but you know, I, I, I doubt if they even thought that it's going to go. That stage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the sort of, you know, the, the kind of like the saxophone, this wailing saxophone, you've got a lot of the kind of, you know, whatever, but it's, it seems to be caught up with that sort of white funk, avant funk noir, you might say, <laughs> that, that, that's going on at that time. So. Sure, yeah, I think, you know, it, it seemed to like uh, the whole thing. The, in Sheffield, um, the music, the electronic music, and so on, seemed to go very quickly in some ways. You know, uh, move into into different into different forms. You know, and so um, the electronic aspect. Uh, <laughs> so the electronic aspect for me, uh, I kind of wanted to do something more with conventional instruments 
and with a, a sort of conventional line up here, you know, drums, bass, whatever, you know, guitar and so on, and try and yeah. formulate something new with that. And it was like really for me an experiment, you know, to, to do that. So I kind of, st there's, there's electronic elements in it and in the production and so on, uh, but it was more a push towards another kind of music, another form of music. And I, I wanted to really explore. So, you know, it, it kind of like, it went into that, you know, um, until, I don't know, until later on, I guess, when I came back again to electronic yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose at that point, I mean, obviously, like, I was a sort of earnest little post punky enemy reader, whatever, and Clock DVA seemed to be part of this kind of sort of cultic landscape. And you must have kind of felt like you were part of something. Obviously, it wasn't a chart thing, but it was certainly something. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, the, the focus at that time seemed to change when the press really got involved and, and, and you know, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, record companies as well were interested in, and, and were giving deals and making deals with, with, with groups and so on. So there was like a, a kind of um, a desire, I, I guess, or a, a sort of uh, feeling, you know, that it, groups wanted to sort of take up these opportunities, you know, and so on. But I think it, you know, it, it did change things, mm. undoubtedly, you know, and the solidarity that was there in the, in the groups, in the early scene, kind of, you know, went to the side as everybody sort of focused on their own kind of little kind of area and started pursuing different things, you know, and, and so on. Yeah. I think it lost something. Well, it gained something, but it lost something as well. I think that's, you know, it's probably always the case, you know. But again, I suppose, maybe slightly spurious, but much as like Manchester and to an extent Liverpool gain a certain sort of mythology in those early 80s years through the post-punk period, obviously so did Sheffield. And um, people perhaps sort of might have read into something about uh, <laughs> Sheffield for sure, all yeah, the things. He'll be in the He's on top of it. But, um, um, you know, was there a sense, you know, were you sort of queried about this idea of Sheffieldness and the significance of that in terms of times of recession and like, you know, the, the ailing north and all that kind of stuff? And uh... Yeah, I, th I always thought, you know, Sheffield was like a poor cousin, really, in, in, to, to Manchester and London, you know, and, and, and all the focus was on... Richer than Leeds, I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was like, you know, uh, I felt, you know, that we, we were like kind of left behind in some degrees with the, with the, with the, the, with the focus sort of things, uh, which was kind of, uh, what's the word, you know, I mean, it was just one of those things, I guess, you know, like you know, at certain places, you know, get more focus than, than other places, you know, and London and Manchester were getting more focus than Sheffield, you know, although, you know, we were, we were producing really interesting musics and so on. We, we were never, it was never kind of up on that level of thing, you know, like Joy Division and so on. Mm. Um, so there was like a kind of, you know, uh, a disparity between the cities and all that, you know. Yeah. But we just had to sort of do, get on and do what we did anyway, you know, and so on, you know, make. Like I said, like in the beginning, we made things happen, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you know, came the Polydor deal and uh, the Barthage and all that. And, um, and I always think that, like, you know, with the Czech League, well, on one hand, you had the kind of, um, um, you know, the human leagues or whatever, even Heaven 17 or whatever, that the determination to go pop. Um, and then people like Cabri Voltaire, who they just didn't have it about them, you know. I think Stephen Mallard and Maya wanted to sort of have some sort of hit, but just innately there wasn't really that thing about them. And I always felt Clock DVA were perhaps somewhere in between that because there was the prospect of that. And, you know, you're talking about like there was that sort of brief era in which things might have gone that way. Sure, um, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. You, know, you, were, you were sort of fraternising with the Stones, weren't they? Rolling yeah. Stones. Yeah. <laughs> What, what was the story there with the video? Oh yeah, that, that was uh, when we, we did a show in uh, Paris at the band's douche, which is like a Turkish band, so it's a famous venue. And we were due to do a show there, we arrived and uh, 
we were late and so we wanted to sort of get set up because we had all these Venetian blinds and, and so on with projections to set up and stuff and uh, when we got there uh, to, to Rolling Stones were making a video in there and I didn't you know we didn't realize who it was so we kind of stormed in and said you know who the fuck is this <laughs> and these guys you know fucking hell come on we want to you know and then, then you know then you shift your ass you know, mate then you saw like you know Keith Richards and someone else in a room you know getting photographs taken and then realising you know the stars were there making this video but uh, they, you know they, they were quite nice they were alright asked us to, to actually go into the video so were you extras in the video? me, me and Paul yeah me and Paul in, in the audience I think you can see us at one point where I thought mm. like, <laughs> you know, see, I've got a really long hair it's funny you know uh, but yeah I mean you know we, we were doing a lot of shows. I mean, we were doing like two, you know, we were doing like major shows, uh, like you know, like huge festivals, and uh, it was just getting to me, you know, like this uh, process of studio tour, album, t-shirt, going on and on, you know, and all this kind of thing. I mean, we, we were being sort of lined up really to become a kind of, you know, a, 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 a studio. A, a stadium type group you know to do shows and big sh you know and, and all this and yeah I mean I, I just kind of I ran away from it in the end mm. I, I was at this this it was before this uh, show in Paris this band's do it was it was before that and it was a huge festival uh, I remember being on the side of the stage and, and uh, I think it was uh, Big country came on, and these <laughs> big Scottish lads came like running on, like really banging with the big boots and you know with a guitar and running around. You know, I thought, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, what's, the hell? what's this? You know, what's this? You know, mm. you know, I, I didn't really sign up. Sign up, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so you know, I, I kind of got, it, I sort of took it to where I wanted it to go, and then mm. thought, yeah, and then. You know, dis disbanded it, dis disintegrated. I remember talking to Chris and Cozy around a similar sort of time as this. I think they felt that if they kind of pushed on a little bit, they could have like sort of pitched over into the whole pop realm. But they just didn't fancy, and they just thought, you know, it. You, you don't subvert it; it subverts you. You know, if you're going to go along that way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I, I think it's uh, yeah. It's it's something. It's it's like a thin line, red line where you you go. Mm. You know, either you, you go into it in full well, yeah. you know, or, or you kind of compromise it and do a little bit of subversion. Mm. I don't think you can do so much with it mm. at certain points, you know, it's, mm. it's kind of very difficult. To, I mean, some some people have tried, I think, you know, I think there has been attempts that people have, mm. have done it to some degree, you know, mm. but uh, I think you, you've got to be true to yourself in the end, you know, mm. so that's the main thing. Yeah. You, you, really, so. you kind of make music you, you want to make, you know, because it, it really, it's your expression, isn't it? It's your, yeah. you know, your creativity, so, yeah. you know, you should be true to that creativity, you know, and if someone likes it or, you yeah. know. Mm. And I suppose, obviously, you know, you couldn't make much more a pointed statement in this respect then to go on form the anti-group but of course the anti-group communications that been a project that you'd had on the sort of back then for a while it? it was 1978 with the late Stephen Turner yeah 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 so well, it was always a side thing that was going on sure yeah yeah it was uh it was something I wanted to do um which DBA kind of took over all my time in a way and I couldn't really Kind of focus on 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 doing that at that mm. point. So when this this split came, uh, I decided really to, to to step back and to go into something mm. that I wanted to really pursue, and that was the undergroup. So I spent you know a few years just sort of create you know getting musicians and, and working with material and doing stuff, and, and then putting more and more things that I'm really concentrating on doing more and more kind of performances and events, you know, because it was pretty ambitious, um, you know, like staging 
an anti-theatre presentation we did in Den Haag at this Pandora's festival, which is a huge sort of festival. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said, well, like, we want to do, you know, we want to do this setup where we have uh, five tape recorders, you know, on a, on a, around a desk, you know. And, and and a huge, you know, two screens, you know, with a film on there to sort of the discussion. And I edited all these, uh, physically edited all these reel to reels. Uh, it was purely auditory. I didn't even know what it was going to sound like because I didn't have five tape recorders to play it back on, you know. And I, I didn't have, I didn't have a way of. I, I suppose I could have, you know, somehow I could have perhaps tracked them or something like that. But I didn't really. Kind of think of it like that. I thought of it as a al purely allotory experiment, really, where I only know what it's going to be like when it's done. You know, yeah. And we did we did that. You know, uh, in a context of a, a big festival before we did the, the sort of uh, delivery. You know, which was like a, a soundtrack piece, a TAG one. Uh, so you know. It, it was a very ambitious sort of project and we wanted to do more things, you know, like publications and, and film, yeah. as well as recordings and so on, you know. Right, yeah. And to really move it into those kind of areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I suppose at this point the pop dream stroke nightmare is over. Um, <laughs> there's no going back to that and you kind of find out there's more to life, there's more in this world than the UK top 40. There are other territories, there's Europe, and you're finding you're able to kind of undertake all of these activities. And um, so I just want to put Ted, Ted in there because I remember you, you saying that, in fact, it was the activities of the anti group that really first got you interested in, you know, work, work, working with Abby. But yes, absolutely. I mean, of course, I was also, uh, as I say, the, the, the Clark DBA fan. In fact, I knew Clock TV before the anti group, and I think the first anti group uh, album was The Delivery that I, that I bought when it came out, and that was really like a revelation to me. And, um, and thereafter, all, all the, the following ones from Ha, Zulu, and uh, then finally Digitarium, the Neontological series. So this, they've been highly, highly influential to my, to my own as a musical experience. And, uh, and especially, uh, I must uh, repeat again that the, the live performance in the museum uh, Luigi Pecci in, in Prato, there was really something, something completely like new and, and mind opening. Uh, so after that, let's say my vision was music and but also this kind of multimedia. Um, Opportunities you know, to, to create art. I really changed when I was really pursuing this, this kind of way of doing it. So it's been very influential. And then I'm Sonic, as I say, like because I, I, I started doing it. So I would say at least uh, since 96, 97, when I started really programming computers to, to, to make this kind of sound field experiences and, you know, I was always remembering Digitarian and always thought, oh, one day, you know, it would be great to hear this, how they make it. And in fact, uh, it's interesting because I moved to the Netherlands in 2002 and then I became friends with the community here of artists and musicians, etc. And one of them was Justin Bennett, who happened to be also in, in the lineup of uh, Digitarian uh, album. And it was nice because he explained me also more in detail how they did the recording and, um, and you know, how they were, kind of the technologies they were using and with uh, correct microphones. And then, of course, with Adi, we went into it more further details. But anyway, yeah, I think it was, you know, uh, very, very important yeah. for my experience. It was our point of contact in a way, our first point of contact. It's interesting, you know, um, with this leader, like having written about electronic music and done a book or whatever, and I noticed that um, the effect on my facial, I seem to have an inordinate number of friend requests from people from Italy, and I think this, this is, um, you know, this, this is part of it. And I know that perhaps Clock TVA, there's a particular interest 
coming from Italy, yeah. and it was something I wasn't, I have to say, I wasn't really, really aware of. I mean, you know, it's, it's great, but I mean, you know, you, you weren't like in complete isolation in Italy, you know, having these kinds of interests. There were, there's a lot of it. I think con Contemporary Records played a you know, great role in, also in uh, producing and promoting the artist's work, um, especially the, the clock DJ, I guess. Um, so, um, I think Clock DJ performed quite many times in Italy. In fact, I've been to quite many concerts, DBA, and funny enough, uh, I think I, I talked to Adi at some of these events, some of the concerts, like before or after the concert. And uh, one day, I think a few years ago, when I was in Truro in Cornwall, we were recording um, Neoteric EP at Addis uh, Studio in, in Cornwall, he think Addis came out with this tape. There was a tape that I gave him at the end of one of his concerts, the tape of my music, and we were kind of remember exchanging those two things, which was very nice. So I also really appreciate that even at that time when I was, you know, literally nobody and he was already doing those fabulous concerts, he was very open to exchange and to you know, create this again, this human uh, level of uh, you know mm. connectivity and change, so that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose I did that another thing that was happening at the time is that you really were in the kind of subsequent records that you were making were definitely moving back towards you know the very earliest things you did and going back into electronics and you know sort of you know the old cyberpunk type influence things in you know, dreams or whatever um, and that was definitely the way you know the direction you intended to go in yeah it was kind of a, almost going back to the earliest kind of experiments that I'd been making on horology mm. after the future and looking and really exploring sound again you know in, in a different in a diff, in a new way i say new but you know in a, a re kind of reworking in a way using the, you know the technology uh, that's available at that point you know uh, so we um kind of we're looking back to the original source material like the the Malalvich and, and so on, you know, and that early Russian experimental movements, the suprematists and, and the constructivists. Yeah. I mean, I, I made a, a track, I think the constructivist was a track on one of the urology DVA early pieces anyway, it was like a, a homage to, to constructivism, you know, in, in, in different ways. So it was like looking back at that period of time and, and realizing how advanced it was, you know, mm. you know, and they were dealing with phonetics and, and, and reshaping language and, yeah. and so on. And looking and looking at the experimentation they were making at that time is, is, is phenomenal because they were making, they were looking at the physiological aspects of making music, you know, mm. how, yeah. how we, how we move, how we, you know, how how the the brain functions with making music, you know, and how it affects uh, the, the the whole thing, you know. And so they were taking apart many things and, and reconstructing them, you know. And this whole idea of the, the constructor was uh, mm. was you know fundamental to sort of this new kind of uh, pieces we were making, you know. And and obviously they. The black square was very kind of important as a painting, you know, even though it was nothing. It's just a black yeah. square, you know, but it, it really fundamentally changed the way we think about things, you know. Yeah. And these are kind of important points in time, you know, that I think artists kind of achieve a, a moment of transcendent kind of, you know, space where the idea is so enormous you know it, it goes on then into the fabric of, of society into yeah. culture yeah i mean i mean i was just going to say earlier on um there is it's not a contradiction but it's a paradox that the kind of ideas that you're exploring on the new album are perhaps best explored 
through the electronic medium. Um, you know, you can't really do it with banjos. It's, uh, <laughs> it's you know, it, it's, it's, and then, you know, that's, it, it, it's, it's a paradox, not a contradiction, yeah. it's true, yeah, because, yeah, you know, electronic yeah. is yeah. the most kind of supple, expressive, innovative means of, of you know, yeah. The, 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 Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, the technology we have in, in computers is, is, is amazing, really. It's fantastic. I mean, we're, you know, for me, it's an ideal tool, really. I mean, when I used to, you know, I used to, like I said, I'd cut up tapes and, and, and do things like this, but I think there's still room for that. I think there's still room for experimental analog uh, systems, for sure. And I do go back to them sometimes, and I do, do things like that, you know. Uh, but the computer yeah. is a means to an end, in a way. You know, it's how you use it, the technology. I think it's, you know, what you put in, it's what the human puts in. Yeah. The, the computer will just sit there and do nothing, you know. Mm. But when, when you engage and start to use it in such a way, heuristically, let's say, you know, then you start to create these feelings and atmospheres, you know, and that's what I think Tez and I do, you know, intuitively is to create... Uh, sounds and music pieces that have a human theory there is a there's an el there's that element in there that we hope comes through in the compositions you know that engages the human side of us as well but you're right you know that those sounds act they what's the word they the, the colors of those sounds are, are very much um, you know Relevant and relevant to, to the to the album and the overall tonality and feel of it and the idea of it, you know, yeah. the spatial content in it as well. Because yeah. yeah. you were just talking about what was going to come on to next, which is, in a sense, the paint. You were originally a painter before a musician, and as we mentioned earlier on, you know, you had that very early interest in things like Dada, Nazi surrealism, the, the various futurisms, Russian, Italian, and you know, that, that has tremendous appeal to me because, as you say, I mean, over, well over a hundred years ago, all kinds of avant-garde ideas were kind of set in motion, um, which perhaps took a very long time to feed into electronic music because there wasn't such a thing as electronic music. But those concepts and ideas and that conceptual approach to creativity, um, you know, I always find it really, you know, it's satisfying when I meet someone like yourself who, who, who abides by all of that, who was influenced by all of that, you know, because I think there's far too little of that in... In British music, frankly, but you know, there were obviously the cabs, clearly, as you can tell by the name, and yourself. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's you know, that's that's why I, I mean, I still paint now, I still create physical art uh, and so on, and, and multimedia art and so on. So, the practice of making is, is, is you know, is expanded in, in by doing music. I mean, I think. Those things are, uh, like I say, you know, you, you try, you, you've got to be true to yourself. So, you, you know, those kinds of forms of expression, what I've been involved with all my life, you know, since I was a kid, I was drawing and doing paintings and stuff. So, and that was my interest, you know, no one had to tell me about it or say, you know, do this. Or I did it. And that's what I did. And I would continue doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. And... I think that's what you've got to do. You've got to pursue your interests, you know. And art, painting, or theatre, or, or music, or whatever it is, you know, has to be coming from a place, you know, that's like it's a catharsis in a way. It's like a kind of, you know, you have to do it. You have to. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned the kind of Russian future, of course, the Italian future, and I was going to test here. I mean, Russell, the art of noises, you know, this is something, this obviously had a, unfortunately, slightly fascist element to it, but the, um, but the Italian futurists clearly, manifestly, you know, across all realms, including music, um, have a profound influence. I just wonder... Theatre as well, performance. Well, yeah, certainly theatre, but yeah, uh, 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 yeah everything, cooking, yeah, cooking, yeah, cooking yeah, architecture. Yeah, yeah. The two of the guys together now made the theatre, the, yeah. you know, something of the sun, I think it is. Where they had, uh, you know, they had projections and sounds and those other things. And it was, it was very advanced. I mean, the whole aspect of performance in Italian theatre is, is, is incredibly uh, advanced, actually. 
but very little is known about it. You don't okay. you don't really see so much. I mean, I, I was I've been lucky to find a few books about it, you know, and, and, and through purely by chance, really, I guess, which are well out of date now. But you know, the, the things they contain are, are incredible. You know, really yeah. advanced forms of, of multimedia. They were talking, you know, magnetic theatre. They were they're talking about, you know, making uh, uh, like a virtual almost. Like a, a kind of a technology at that point, but pushing that technology in such a way, you know, mm. it was like really out. Yeah, wow, yeah. Well, I think we 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 can never really stop going back and and look at the um, uh, futurist manifestos and find not find something new, something uh, else to to explore. So that's the, the wonder of it. I think you know. It's, it's amazing that they were not just thinking about it, they were, you know, making it, they were attempting all of what they were writing, and of course with the means they had at the time, which today are much more expanded, so to speak, so we can, you know, still take all these ideas and expand upon them with the technologies we have now, and, and still find something new, and, uh, and go more into the details of, what, of, of those ideas, and, and keep exploring, I think that's the... the Pretty incredible, indeed. Yeah, I just wonder if, the, if there's a sense of the legacy of Russello if you like, in future among contemporary Italian people. <coughs> well, I believe so. I believe, um, and I strongly believe so. And, and uh, I think you know, it's a bit of maybe in the in the DNA, maybe also of, um, of some uh, Italian artists and creative uh, people. But um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint now specific artistic experiences there. But uh, for sure, I feel it. I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the legacy is strong. I mean, I remember I was very young, probably about 13, maybe 14, and this there was a Biennale in Venice about few futurists. And it was, you know, very very influential at the time. The catalog was just amazing. And all these ideas suddenly kind of pop up again in the you know, kind of public arena for you know both like uh, traditional art, which which was what Venice was also meant to you know propose, but also a lot of different things. So people were discovering the futurists again. It was you know mid eighties uh, because of this big event. Yeah. And I think after this, a lot, a lot of really experimental projects were uh, were born that were, you know, again exploring these ideas. These, these. So it's kind of coming back, maybe periodically, like this, you know, reevaluation of, of um, the future. And I also believe that there is a lot of taboo with respect to the participation of, of some of uh, different spirits there, at least from from Marinetti for sure, and some of other the two. To infiltrate, you know, that kind of uh, system, passive system from the inside, and act more like a virus, you know, like hacking from the inside, which is, you know, what we should learn to do now, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And finally, um, Abisonics, it's come up a few times, we've talked about it. Um, perhaps you can just sort of expand on the value of Abisonics, what it it well, it's interesting. We, we spoke about it. Mentioned it. Mentioned Digitarium recently uh, last year. I uh, went back to the original uh, master ten-inch reel analogs and and, and have transferred that now onto uh, to a, to a master. So it's going to be reissued later this year, uh, along with. Uh, uh, some other recordings that were made in those sessions, which were which were really great pieces, but were never released because of the length of the CDs and so on. So we're doing a, I'm doing a sort of complete ambisonic recordings uh, album, which is like a double album, and it's all remastered from the album. It sounds really great, you know, because you know obviously for years of transference on CDs, you know, that quality is, is, is partially uh, compromised, you know. So going back to the originals and being able to kind of put that together, it's really uh, interesting for me because, you know, I'm going to 
trying to write some notes and stuff for the, for the booklet, there'll be a booklet with it as well. And uh, some, uh, a gallery in, in New York of, uh, who specialise in ambisonic recordings and performances of Got in, got in touch with me last year. It was, it was kind of serendipity, really, and, and expressed an interest in, in, in having this album, you know, to, 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 to use and have for, for a week or whatever, you know, as a, a thing you can come and listen to in, in a real ambisonic sound theatre, you know. Yeah, because it seems like one of those things that, you know, perhaps needs to have that yeah you need you need the 360 degrees and, and above really and below you know i mean the whole sound field experience but uh, yeah they, they 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 were really inspired by digitarian it's one of the reasons why they set up this gallery and space was to kind of specialize in ambisonic so it was a kind of uh, milestone a key keystone for that for those guys so hopefully later this year well, the album will definitely come out, and I'm hoping that we can premiere it in New York at this theatre, you know. Mm. I mean, you know, there's, there's other things that might happen as well, but it's all kind of theoretical at the moment. You know, the, the friend of ours in Italy was talking about doing an ambisonic conference, you know, bringing all kinds of people together from the field of ambisonics and putting on some actual ambisonic performances, you know, with the... Uh, set up, ambisonic set up, which, it, which would be fantastic, you know. I mean, that's the thing, I think, with it, it you really need, you need, I mean, it works great on a system, you know, in, in stereo, in stereo, in hand stereo, anyway. And on headphones, it sounds brilliant, you know. Yeah. But to actually, in in a live context, with, with, with sound being moved, and, and uh, the whole sound feel engaged is a, is a really different experience, you know. And I think, you know, that that's something, it's really site specific. You've got to have the funding, you know, the, the technology's got to be there. So it's not like something that happens all the time or yeah. can just be kind of put up, you know. It really needs to be planned and, and, and financed and so on, so. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean to do more. I think, you know, we're going more towards that anyway. I mean, in in, in video and sound tracks and yeah. so on for cinema is more, you know, yeah, is more engaged in. You know, but public like, events. That's the interesting thing. Yeah. People actually having to gather. I've been to a few things like this, like the People Like Us project, I and mean, who knows anything like that. And it can only be experienced in a, a venue, you know, among. Other people, you know, yeah, yeah. seen that. And I think, and again, going back to the human thing. Yeah, know. I think it's good that that, that you know the, the live context yeah. happening in a live context with people involved and, and an audience and so on. I think it's very important, you know, mm. to to do more and more of that kind of thing. Yeah, because yeah. you know, it, it, like you say, it's like a you know, it's a one 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 time experience, you know, mm. and you have to be there to sort of you know. <laughs> 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 Yeah, right. Well, I mean, yeah, we're up to the nine o'clock. Yeah. Now, we'll so, um, some uh, Q&A. If... Yeah, if anybody, um, I don't know if there's, um... oh, I might have to shout a bit. Sorry, we're going to have to get that microphone. Oh, unless... There's a microphone over there. If anybody, yeah, that's it. Yeah. If, if anybody wants to ask. If anybody wants to ask. Any questions? Well, no. well, I consider it an insult if people do because I thought <laughs> I've covered all absolutely all topics yeah. comprehensively. But yeah. there you go. I mean, I find it very interesting the talk on ambisonics. I mean, when I first heard Digitaria years ago, I worked at, for a white TS in Liverpool. I worked in a 16 track studio. Um, and around just after the, that, uh, and it worked really well in the studio. But just after that, if you remember the PTV album, uh, Dreamfest oh, yeah. Sweets. Yeah. And a lot of people used to say about Dreamfest Sweets that it was bollocks. <laughs> so what do you think about that? What do you mean? The, 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 no, uh, no, I mean, the, the holophonics. The make work really well, but... The holophonics. Holophonics yeah. was a bit... I mean, yeah, if you had a four-speaker system, it, it could work. But there were other people saying, like, Genesis bullshitting me. Really. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I don't know, I mean, I, I kind of, my interest in, uh, psych, you know, in, 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 in 
or from a good, I mean, when from a good sort of uh, came to an end. Uh, psychic TV, some of it I liked, but I, I just, I don't know. It was a bit cultish. This, this aspect of a, of a cult, yeah, I was never really, you know, uh, into that idea of no. joining any kind of, you know, uh, group as such, you know, I was for. Kind of I just thought the, the difference with the holophonic system, with the su supposed dummy head, um, which recorded this this way, some people were actually saying that it was all bullshit. Um, whereas experiencing something like ambisonically works, you know, if you're in the right, as you say, you know, environments, you, you can get that all around. Oh yeah, the, 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 the ambisonics are probably the, 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 the truest realisation mm -hmm. of the sound field. Yeah. In that you know, it's based on a, on psychoacoustic principles mm -hmm. and, and so on. And there was a lot of research that was made for many many years until they arrived at the tetrahedral microphone, which is the centre of it really, which records all sound from all directions, above, below, and three hundred and sixty degree around. So it it was developed really to record live uh, music as well and um, but it, it works definitely yeah. um, and on the headphones you can really truly hear movement you know because we physically moved sound around as well we didn't just kind of you know pan, pan stuff although yeah. the panning is very linear like 360 degrees like on a, on a joystick or something like that so you can move it you know, literally all, all, all around and so on. But physically moving with sound as well, doing sounds and percussion and moving. So you can hear that, you know. Mm, definitely. You know, definitely. And, and, you, and you get that whole feel of being submerged in this whole sphere of sound, you know. I mean, I can't comment on the holophonics, but I mean, the holophonics, I did read a number of things at the time that it was based more like a binaural kind of yeah. system. Yeah. One, of the, uh, see one of the TG live albums which is called binaural. Yeah. Binaural, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, the binaural I think is okay. I mean, the, the holophonics, I don't know because I, I haven't really listened to so I mean, I like some of the tracks from the Dreams Less Sweet, to be honest. Uh, but uh, in terms of which system is better, I would definitely say the, the, oh, cow, the yeah. cowling. Well, ambisonics is is the true surround sound for sure. Yeah. But to a seventeen year old at the time, you know, you hear this ambisonic album and you know, at the time drugs were involved. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of like brought the old um the atmosphere of it, but in the studio I said there's only sixteen track mixing decks, but we had to go through the four speakers. And it, sounded great, yeah, huh? it just sounded amazing. It really did. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for your question. Mm. Hello, Eddie. Um, you were talking at the beginning of the uh, talk about um, kind of a machine versus human, um, you know, philosophy, mentality, whatever. Um, Cybernetics, that's what it is. <laughs> no, but what I was trying is, what I was trying is on, on, the, the, human, on, on the human side, yeah. is it, um, despite, you know, doesn't matter whether we're electronic or standard bands, um, we all try and con people like David into telling them that everything was planned from the minute on, but in reality, within the process, there are kind of errors that, put you into um, other directions and, um, and and get you and get you to somewhere where you didn't particularly feel you, that you were you didn't even imagine that you were going but kind of you find the general result I mean was was that more of the case especially with the uh, horology experiments I mean the experiment itself being stand or fall depending on yeah, I, 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 what 
it's an important point what you're saying. I think you know that obviously there is a, a kind of spontaneity, like we spoke about, the improvisational aspect of music. You know where you know the, an intuitive aspect comes into play, and certainly you know accidental uh, things happen as well. You know. Um, I like to think, like Jackson Pollock said, you know, that you know he denied the accident. He said he controlled, to some degree, the the, the layering of the pain and how it happened. To some degree, there was an element, of course, that kind of goes beyond it. The sense that accident is part of the plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he sort of he, he made reference to the idea of you know he denied, he said he denied the accident, which I, I kind of understood. You want the accident in some ways but you want to be able to sort of you know be able to control that it seems sort of paradoxical but in some ways you want to so it's not become so it doesn't become the whole thing you know where everything is then accidental you know so you like use those elements but then on the other end the accident is something that the machine might not recognise. Sure, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, heuristics is a, is an aspect of, of, of computing, you know, that, that they say, you know, we can, we can engage in, you know, and uh, yeah, we should, it, it's like a fear, I guess, of, of, of technology, you know, that we shouldn't, you know, that you can't do certain things or you, you shouldn't press that button, you know. <laughs> but, you can, you know, you can, of course, you know, and these do produce interesting things, you know, absolutely, I, I totally agree, you know, you can pre-plan, you can sort of design stuff to some, you know, point, but then there is that element, unknown element that comes, I guess, you know, it's like painting, you know, I can, when I do a painting, I, I have an idea of what it's going to be, you know, I map it out to some degrees and so on. But then in the actual process of painting, new things happen, you know, new colours, new ways paint falls with other paint, or, you know, the image change, you know, it blurs, you know. It Happy happens. accidents. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so there's always, there's always an element of, of the accidental uh, and the, the uh, like I was saying earlier, the aleatory aspect you know like i was saying about this this thing that i made for this discussion and, and i i never i didn't hear it until it was played in this huge festival with like thousands of people there you know and it was like really i i didn't know what was going to happen with the tapes because i had five tapes and I had, so i had how many channels let's see six seven eight nine ten tracks and on each one was like an edit of dialogue from different sources, like I took some from John Cage, I took some from sort of assassination of John Kennedy, I took some from a surrealist a lecture from surrealism and, and some other stuff. So I didn't know what, what was going to happen and when I was working through it, it, it was amazing because at one point, at some point, it all, it came together like one big voice and I was quite, it, it quite kind of perturbed me in a way, you know, and I felt this like kind of, you know, strange sensation that these voices had, had all come together somehow and you know it was purely aleatory because the timing of each one and where they lay and how they they came through was completely by chance so, you know that's interesting I think you know, sometimes it can work really 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 well you know um, so to answer your question you know the, the machine can make accidents <laughs> if you prompt it to do so. <laughs> three, three, back there. there you go. Out if you want. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I was really happy that you mentioned Jackson Pollock because I think that uh, that's the same uh, uh, artistic process that created the Intonarumori by Luigi Russolo 
in which the accident was the root of what we had. It, it was the accident, the accident originally, and then it was turned into a work of art by the human hand, which is also why I believe we shouldn't be uh, scared of AI or ChatGPT and all that stuff because, well, obviously it's great fun, but it doesn't go beyond fun. So why don't we just have fun with it? And also, I, I would like to ask something to the Italian guy on the screen. Can you hear me, Italian guy on the screen? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah yes. I can hear you. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you pissed me off a bit because you can, you said that Marinetti uh, basically wasn't a fight. He was a good guy. Come on, let's domesticate Marinetti so that we have a justification for him to be studied. No, we don't need that. We can still say that Marinetti was a fascist and was a great artist all the same. We should live with this contradiction, not try to domesticate it. All right, but I mean, I, I would subscribe to this perspective too, so don't, don't get me wrong. It's just that I think we should, you know, we, we shouldn't put this too much in, into this political perspective, in my opinion. I mean, like, and, and uh, we can, we, we, maybe we can't really understand in full what was going on at the time and, and how they were operating within, you know, that context. So that's where I think we, whichever uh, judgment we come up with, I think it won't be precise anyway. So I, you know, I apologize if that pisses you off, but uh, you know, I think we shouldn't. We should have more fun ourselves and not care about that so much. I think so. I mean, Marinetti did say at one point we should fight against moralism feminism and all other forms of utilitarian cowardice. This <laughs> word, it's not like <laughs> but, but, no, I think there's Simon, I think yeah, there is a validity to Marinetti as an artist, certainly. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, you've got to, it's, uh, it's, uh, again, it's a, it's a thin line between the, the politics or the, the morality of the artist and, and the work, you know, it's like Belmo or so on, you know, and you can say, you know, this and that. But at the end of the day, the, the, there's a beauty in this uh, bestiality, you know, this, you know, this, this, you know, thing, you know, that he, that he does, that he did in his drawings, which is, you know, it's, it's sadistic, 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 sadistic. It's like Sad, it's like Sad, it's like saying Sad's just, uh, you know, uh, one dimensional, you know, just about, you know, torture or, or, or massacre or, or inflicting pain, but it, 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 it's not true. Sard was philosophical in many ways. He studied anthropology, he studied about sociology, he understood all these, these are analogies, these, these are like, they're like ciphers of some kind. Um, worked into into these into the fabric of this art you know and or, or, and sometimes what's perceived is, is what's on the front of it seems outrageous and you know it's like wow yeah, that's, that's a bit too much you know I don't know. It, it, to me italian futurism is absolutely vital he also said we should glorify war um, the world's greatest form of hygiene uh, which wasn't much consolation to the artist on Berto Boccioli who got killed in World War One when he was thrown off his horse, but there you go. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I mean they were into speed, weren't they? Into mm. machines, oh, yeah. into, machines into, that, yeah. into that war, and into, into, in that sense, like a kind of, you know, a, a velocity of action and so on. I mean, it's fascinating because of the unapologetic flaw yeah, of yeah, yeah. in a sense. Yeah, I mean, you can't... And, I mean, perhaps I said art shall be convulsive for mm. seems to be beauty. Mm. Shall be compulsive for seems to be. Yeah. And 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 so it you know, that's true, you know. Andre if, Breton was a bit weird as well. He was, yeah, yeah. But he was against the promotion well, of homosexuality. He, yeah. yeah he seemed a bit well in the Tory party. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> but, yeah, he, I mean he, he tried despite to, his Jews relationship with a certain Jacques Vachet, but there you go. Yeah, yeah. Vachet was was really the, the, the fundamental he was Pioneer. a weird bloke, so of all the people to be in charge of the surrealist yeah, movement, Andre Breton was 
was just like very odd. Like yeah. putting Captain Mannering in charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he did say some interesting things. Mm. Oh, yeah. And the manifesto yeah. was, were very interesting, what you were saying, for sure. Sure, I mean, you know, uh, you know it's like all artists, I guess, in some ways, you know, there is an aspect to them that, you know, if we knew, you know, we may not like that aspect or something, or there's some element, you know, a dark element somewhere, you know, in the subconscious there or something. But I mean, what do we, what do we do? What do we, we just go on the, the what we see, how it how it makes us feel, you know, and shall we get, you know, shall we gauge it on that or some other thing, and, you know? So I uh, I agree with what you were saying anyway. Fundamentally. Okay. Any so? Anybody? Anybody else? For any questions? Going, 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 oh, wrap going to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Look, thanks a lot for everyone for turning up. It's been fantastic and um, yeah, very yeah, gratifying. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dad. Thanks, thanks everyone, uh, Gabriel, and um, all the little Sorry, Gabriel, maybe I should mention, this is actually this is really missing. It's just one little point that really, you know, that such is the sort of sense of the visual within the pocket that you credit him as, you know, a third member, effectively. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, that's one sure. of the things I'm missing. Yeah, that sure. is, yeah. They're very well worth noticing, you know, because it's audio-visual, you know, again. Absolutely, yeah, I mean... For us, it's a, a vital element of what we do. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. we're, we're going to just show one video from okay. the album, and then I can do some signing if anyone has got any records they want signing, just to uh, do that. Okay.